Welcome to the Word of the Lord, the weekly television broadcast of Living Word Christian Church, proclaiming the good news of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Pastor Mark Clements, in-depth, relevant biblical teachings will help you in life and living in today's world. Now, let's join Pastor Clements in the service already in progress. Hey, let's take a couple Bible questions tonight. Uh, First of all, first of all, uh, I want to say the two-part question that you sent me in that email, uh, the first part having to do with uh, if, you, if, if they can't go on the Internet, what, they, what can they do? And I've got, I've got some, some things I'll, sh- I'll share with you personally uh, in that regard. The second part is probably one of the easiest Bible questions I've ever had to answer. Uh, and so I'll take that one first. Uh, and, and it's simply this. Uh, what does the Bible say about the Ice Age? <clears throat> Next question. <laughs> okay, uh, and the concern comes because her daughter uh, has a has a young boy who went to Sunday school last week, and at Sunday school was taught that the Ice Age is in the Bible. And that when Noah's flood covered the earth, volcanoes went off. I, I must have missed that part when I went through. Does anybody remember that? I'm, no, no, no. And blotted out the sun. And that's when the ice age happened. And, uh, you know, it sounds so foolish. It sounds so frivolous. Why are you bringing it up, Pastor? Well, I'm bringing it up, and I'm not going to give you a bunch of references to it, but both Old Testament and New, this is what your Bible says. Don't you dare ever take anything out of the Bible, and don't you dare ever put anything into the Bible. You don't subtract from what God's Word said, and you don't add to what God's Word said. Uh, I remember we had some, um, some folks very, very early, the very first year, that, that the first full year that, that Living Word was in existence, 1985. Uh, in 84, there were <clears throat> about 11 months of of meetings at one of the local hotel ballrooms. And we got we, we had our, our first facility, independent facility. What a giant step for mankind. Uh, and, and it was down here on the south end of town in the mini mall. Uh, in the basement of the mini mall, we were the underground church, and, and, and that's where we met. We had, and, and had Sunday morning services, Wednesday night services. And we had a couple begin coming to the church, and they had, they had, uh, they had progressed out of a particular uh, faith, uh, a particular religion, uh, and, and within that faith and within that religion, uh, they believed that an angel had shown their group's founder a set of golden tablets hidden under a juniper tree, and they were an addition to the Bible. And, and and I'm trying to kind of beat around the bush, but I, I, I realize I'm losing more of you than I'm than I'm following. So I'll just tell you, it's the Book of Mormon. It's the Book of Mormon. Uh, and uh, see, I don't take up all the different religions and teach you what all the different religions you know have to say about everything and believe in everything. Uh, uh, I, I know one in particular. Uh, he, he's got some real. I think they're flaky ideas uh, about certain things, but uh, he loves the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's accepted him as his personal Savior and confesses him as his Lord, prays in his name, worships him, uh, and he's a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. It's the Mormons. Uh, but when they add to the Bible, anything added to the Bible, that's where they lose me, because your Bible says... Your Bible says, uh, let, let, we, we got to take a look. At it. All right, all right, all right. Revelation chapter 22. I love the word, and I'm a doer of it. I sure, surely hope that you're a doer of this. All right, praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. It should be really easy to find. It's the last chapter of the whole Bible, Revelation chapter 22. <clears throat> and 
Look at verse 7. It says, Behold, I come quickly. That's in, in red if you had a red letter edition. That's Jesus speaking. Blessed is he that keeps the sayings of this prophecy. Now, when we use the term prophecy, uh, we often often limit ourselves. And I, I, I shared this when teaching in the book of Timothy. Remember that? Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 1. Remember that? That you might war a good warfare based on the prophecies that went on before you. And, and, and I came back and, and shared with you that when you see prophecies in the Bible based on the context, uh, many times that means preaching. It doesn't mean somebody standing up in a service and saying, Thus saith the Lord, yea, thus verily, and, 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 and giving a message. That message, according to First Tim, excuse me, First Corinthians chapter 14, that message, one of those inspirational gifts, must complete three things. It must edify, it must exhort, and it must comfort to be a New Testament prophecy. And the Bible says it must be judged and let another judge it judge its validity and judge its biblical, uh, whether or not it, it complies with what the Bible says. And that is that a prophecy edifies, that a prophecy that builds you up, exhorts, that stirs you up and comforts, uh, that cheers you up. Okay, it doesn't correct. It doesn't rebuke. A prophecy doesn't discipline. And a prophecy, now listen real carefully, a prophecy given in a New Testament church setting, a prophecy does not correct, and a prophecy should never direct. Prophecy should never give direction. Never. Well, the Lord told me that I was supposed to tell you that you were supposed to sell your house, give me the money, uh, move to Timbuktu. It's halfway between Oogla Boogla, and, 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 and you'll know when you get there what you're supposed to do. Prophecies never in the New Testament. Never. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. He that speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not unto men, but unto God. For no man understands him. Howbeit in the Spirit he speak mysteries. But he that prophesies speaks to men to edification, exhortation, and comfort. That's, that's your Bible. There's no other definition of prophecy given in the Bible. So a simple prophecy. I didn't say a prophet. Prophets sometimes prophesy. But everyone who prophesies is not a prophet. The Bible says we can all profit that all might learn. And yet Ephesians chapter 4 says some are prophets. Just because you prophesy doesn't make you a prophet. There's very stringent, stringent criteria in the Bible about what, what a prophet uh, is and does and how they function, how they operate. And yet we only see one or two examples in the whole New Testament of a prophet giving anything that could even be conjured as direction. We don't see prophets walking through the churches. We don't see prophets standing up in the assemblies. We don't see prophets writing letters, giving direction to people. You do this, you do that, you move here, you go there, you stay, you leave, none of that. We see Agabus the prophet in Acts chapter 21 walking up to who? The Apostle Paul. And Paul had set himself to go to Jerusalem. This is Acts, Acts 19, 20, 21. In 21, Paul went through every city. You read 20 and 21 in Acts. Paul went through every city, and the Bible says every city he went to, somebody came up to him and said, you shouldn't go to Jerusalem. Every city he went to. And he said, none of these things move me. You can get stiff-necked even if you're an apostle, even if you're a Christian, even if you're born again, even if you're spirit-filled, water-baptized, tongue-talking, even if you worship Jesus and carry your Bible and thump it once in a while. You can get, you can get stiff-necked, hard-headed, and, and I'm just going to do what I do because I know I'm right. I believe what I believe. You, nobody can sway me. You need to be contrite. That means you be moldable and shapeable and correctable and adjustable. Amen. Adjustable. Amen. Adjustable. And, and Paul, he just got himself, I'm going to go back there and I'm going to straighten those Jews out. 
They needed to be straightened out, but he wasn't the one going to do it. And, and every city he went to, he said, everywhere I go, someone stands up and says, bonds and affliction await you. But none of these things move me. I'm going. And so he went. And, and uh, on the way there, on the way there, everywhere he went, it kept happening. On the way there, the Bible says, through the Spirit, believers said you shouldn't go. And then finally, the big gun comes out, Agabus the prophet. And the prophet comes down. And what does he do? He does not walk up to Paul and say, do not go to Jerusalem. He doesn't do that. The Holy Spirit already did that. He said, I go bound in my spirit. People all along the way told him what was going to happen. The prophet didn't tell him what to do or what not to do. The prophet told him what was going to happen if he did. Here's what he does. The, the Apostle Paul, he's ministering, he's walking along, he's, he, he's got, and, and, and Agabus the prophet walks up, stands right in front of him, stops him, takes his own belt off. That's a sash, or the Bible called it a girdle, and, and that's what holds your britches up. And, and that's why I'm not going to take mine off. <laughs> so he, he, he takes his belt off, he takes his own sash off, he takes his own girdle off, he takes it off, he walks over to Paul, and he wraps it round and round and round and round and round and round and round. And he said, that's what's going to happen to you if you go to Jerusalem. He actually took Paul's off, took it, actually took it off of him, and said, the man who owns this girdle, this is what's going to happen to him when he goes, if he goes to Jerusalem. Didn't matter to him if he went or not. He didn't say, please don't go. He just said, that's what's going to happen. Yep. And it was Paul's choice. Thank you. And, and there, there are people, I've heard them today, and they make a very strong cause for you should not love your life even unto death. And Paul was in the will of God, and he wasn't going to let persecution and affliction uh, absolutely in any way uh, hinder him from going to do what he knew the Lord wanted him to do. That's their case. My case is he never got to do it. He did not ever get to go and present the plan of salvation by grace through faith and tell them you don't have to keep the works of the law. He never, ever got to do it. They bound him. They threw him in prison. They beat him. It <clears throat> sidetracked his ministry. And yet, even in the midst of imprisonment, he wrote most of the New Testament that we have yet today and continued to follow the will of God and the plan of God. Don't ever think because you get off track a little bit a step out of the way here or out of the way there, you can never recover yourself. That's nonsense. God will use you anywhere you're at. If you just keep your heart contrite, keep your, keep, keep your, your, your heart humble and, 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 and stay available to him, he'll continue to use you. That's a lie of the devil that tells people, oh, you missed it so bad, you can never recover now. A bird with a broken wing never flies as high again. Where's that in the Bible? Some, some dumb card somewhere. You don't know that to be true? No, no, not at all. No, Peter recovered himself and did far more in, in, in the remainder of his life. Uh, after, after denying that he even knew Christ with cursing, uh, uh, he, he, he did far more after the day of Pentecost, uh, maybe with the exception of Paul, but the two of them kind of mirrored each other and ran together but uh, than anyone we have a, a, a record of the Apostle Peter. Amen. Amen. So, so uh, when it says here in Revelation chapter 22, got a pretty good lesson on prophecy right there. Amen. All right, so, so it says here in verse 7, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is, is he that keeps. What, 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 any of your translation say anything other than keeps? What is it? Obeys. Obeys. Okay, what translation is that? New Living Translation says obeys. That's being a doer of the word, like, like Minister Trailer just, just shared here when, when uh, he was receiving the offering. Uh, it's good to be a hearer, but you have to be a doer of the word. James chapter 1 says you can't be a hearer only or you deceive yourself. It's not the hearers of the law that are blessed, the word of God. It's the doers thereof. So I can hear all day long that it says love your enemies, but I do have to do that. I can, I can hear all day long uh, that it says, bring your tithe into the storehouse, but I have to do that. I can hear all day long that it says, walk in love. Forgive everyone who's sinned against you. Oh, 
am I? Huh? Don't forsake assembling together. Don't let the sun go down in your wrath. Don't let any corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Be sincere and without offense till the day Christ returns. Look for his coming. Pay your taxes. <laughs> That's what the Bible says. That's what your Bible says. And, and uh, uh, to be a doer. So it says blessed. Say it. Blessed. Is he that keeps, obeys, is a doer of the sayings of the prophecy. The margin of my Bible says the message of this book. The message of this book. Now, do you notice this last word in this verse is not plural? There's no books. There's no books that you and I and every other believer, every other disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, there's no books that you and I are commanded to obey, to practice, to be doers of, to love. There's no books. There's no, well, this is an added book. The couple I told you about, 1985, uh, they invited us over for dinner to their house. Uh, uh, you, you know, when you've only got like three or four or five, you know, six families in the whole church. I mean, they can each pick just one day of the week and you can have dinner every night somewhere. Uh, but we went over to their house. <coughs> We've since learned to inquire about what you're going to serve before we get there. Now, that may not make us, may, you know, my staff helps me with this. Exactly what is it that you're going to serve? And if they say, well, we've got this new recipe we're going to try. They're trained really well. They say, try it on somebody else and see how it goes. And they help us. This, these folks didn't help us. And, and so we went. I'd like to say we enjoyed it. I'd like to. Uh, but, but, but found out then, like so many times is the case, uh, they didn't want to have a meal. They, they didn't want to have a meal. They didn't want to have us over to fellowship and break bread. Uh, they, they, they wanted to come and say, we really think it would help you and help your ministry and help the people that you minister to if you understood what we understand. So well, what, what, what's that? Well, there's another book. I said, uh, there is, huh? There's another book. The Lord saw fit to send an angel, and and, and uh, I, you know I don't I don't I don't even get into it. I don't know what I go down this trail for anyway. <laughs> but the angel's name is Moroni. Have you ever looked at it? It's Moron. I. <laughs> it is. It is. It's, <laughs> it is Moron. I. It. I, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Moroni, okay, and, and, and led, led this man down to the juniper tree, and there were two golden tablets, and, and they became this extra book, which is in addition to the Bible. Uh, I mean, I've had people do, do things so innocently and say, well, pastor, you know that's a sin. I say, you're adding to the Bible. The Bible doesn't call it a sin. The Bible doesn't even mention it, not even one time, this, this activity that you're talking to me about. doesn't even mention it once. And you're telling me it's a sin. You know, mowing dandelions off, at that's not a sin. Kill all those little yellow demons. All right, let's keep going. Let's see. This verse says the book. There's only one. There's no additional books. The second thing I took them to was the verse that we're about to look at later in this chapter. The third verse I took them to was 2 Timothy 3, 16. It says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for Reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness and doctrine, so that the man and woman of God 
<coughs> the translation I had with me that night. The Lord prompted me to take my Bible with me that night when we over, went over there for dinner. And I opened it up and I talked to him. And it, that, that translation, my favorite one, says that the man and or woman of God may be perfect, complete, total, mature, thoroughly furnished, and fully equipped to every good work. And I shut it. She said, what's your point? I said, I've got a book that thoroughly furnishes and f completely and totally and fully equips me. What do I need another book for? And it arrested her. Her mouth hung open. She set that book down. She said, you're exactly right. I said, no, I'm not right. I'm not right about anything. The book is right. And the book says that God inspired these scriptures and they will complete and mature and perfect you and thoroughly furnish and fully equip you. You don't need anything else. You don't need any other second book that, that, that some angel supposedly brushed back the dirt and it's got some special messages that aren't in the other one. Okay, you get all of this, all of this, you know, I, I'd like to say nonsense, it's really just doctrines of demons. Uh, adding to the Bible, the lost books. These were the books that were lost. There are no books that were lost. We've got everything we need right here in these 66. All right, and then here's the, here's the, the, the last verse, what, what, what we started on all of this for. Hope I'm helping you tonight. I know I'm helping you tonight. Bible will always help you. Revelation 22, we love verse 17. The spirit and the bride say, come, let him that hears say, come, and, and him that is a thirst come, whoever, whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. Thank God. The next verse, verse 18. For I testify unto every man that hears the words of the message of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this message, God will take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things that are written in this book. Okay, again, twi twice there, it says this book. It doesn't say these books, this book. Uh, 18 and 19 in that way. And then verse 20, he that testifies these things says, surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so come Lord Jesus, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. It, it, it's kind of like, you know, this is the, this is the, the crescendo right at the end of, 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 of the whole uh, uh, Handel's Messiah. And you come right down to the very last, it's build up and it's, and the last thing he's going to say is, uh, be real cautious what you put into this book that's not there and what you take out of this book that is there. This is not a buffet where you can pick and choose, take a little of this, take a little of that, because you like it, and that's your favorite, and then you don't like this message or don't like that message, and every time it's preached, you cringe, and, and, and uh, uh, just get to love it all. Just get to love it all. Get to love the rebukes. Get to love the reproof. Get to love the promises. Get to love the blessings. Get to love the revelations. Get to love the warnings and admonitions. Get to love the commandments. Psalm 112, verse 1, blessed is the man that, that, that rejoices, blessed is the man that fears God and delights greatly. Delights greatly. One translation says rejoices abundantly in delights greatly in his commandments. Not just the promises, delights greatly in his commandments. I love verse 2, don't you? Praise the Lord. His seed shall be mighty on the earth. A generation of the upright shall be blessed. Poverty and wretchedness shall be in his house. No, I'm sorry. I had that wrong. Wealth and riches shall be in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. Forever. Yeah, that's a person that loves his commandments. Uh, and then I did tell you, I didn't I tell you that this was in the Old Testament too? Second chapter, uh, second book of the Bible, the book of Exodus, chapter 32. Second chapter, excuse me, second book of the Bible, Exodus, chapter 32. Oh, I don't have that right. 
that's talking about blotting them out. Uh, and that's a, uh, that's a reference there to uh, verse 19. But it is in Exodus. Uh, I'll, I'll have somebody help me find that, look that up, uh, where he said, don't add, it, add to it uh, and don't take away from it. Don't add to it and don't take away from it. Uh, I had it. I had it written right on the, the page right here, the, the next page at the end of the Bible. I had it written in here, but that page has fallen out. You know what it's a sign of when there's a Bible that's fallen apart? A life that isn't. That's exactly right. And may your Bible be well worn. Hallelujah. Amen. Wear it out before you go to heaven. You're not taking it with you. Wear it out. Amen. Um, so, so when I hear, when I hear, I mean, it's, it's almost comical uh, when people, they, 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 they take their scientific theories and they have to then explain and try to fit it into the Bible and try to find a way. Now, I'm not going to stand up here tonight and tell you there was no ice age. It's none of my business whether there was an ice age or not. I don't care if there was. I don't care if there wasn't. I know there was a world here when God looked down because the world here was dark. Usually when there isn't any light on this planet for some time, it's going to be frozen. I mean, if you just, just deduct what you know about, uh, turn all the lights off. What, what do you have? Deuteronomy 4, verse 2. Just have them put it right up on the screen. Thank you very much. Appreciate your help with that. Deuteronomy 4, 2. You shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish anything from it that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. So you see, it's, it, God doesn't change. It's not a, it's not a uh, change just so well, it's the last thing in the Bible, and it's the only time he said it. No, it's not the only time he said it. Don't add anything to it, and don't take anything away from it. Just let God be God. Amen. Let God be God. There's enough in your Bible in those, in those 66 books. There's enough just in that New Testament. We don't need anything else, but this particular Sunday school teacher, it's reported to me. I don't know who it was. Don't want to know. Don't know what church it was. Don't want to know. Uh, just the question was asked. These little children in Sunday school came home and said, we were taught in Sunday school that there was an ice age, that during Noah's flood, the volcanoes all, all blasted uh, uh, soot and ash into the atmosphere and it blotted out the sun and everything froze. Uh, I don't know where that came from. I, 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 it's not in the Bible. The question was, is there anything like that in the Bible? The answer is no. Nothing of the sort. Nothing of the sort whatsoever. Nothing. The Bible says that the, uh, the, the heavens opened up. Not just the clouds, folks. The heavens opened up. And it poured rain. I mean, we had a rain, we thought, you know, flooded us pretty bad this summer. It rained six and some inches in three hours. You, you try to imagine a rain like that for 24 hours. Try to imagine a, a, a rain like that for 48 and 72 hours. And 40 days and 40 nights never letting up. And then it says the fountains of the deep. They, they, all, they, they all burst forth, and it flooded the whole earth. That's what your Bible says. Now, if there was an ice age in there, I wonder what happened to the ark, where the entire human race and the entire population of animal life and bird life on the planet was saved. I, I don't remember where they had to chip their way out. I don't, I don't think that happened. Okay, uh, that's again, I think it's not somebody trying, uh, intending to add something to the Bible and then get their name blotted out of the book of life. Uh, I think it's somebody just trying to take some, some theory, some historical scientific theory and trying to fit it in. Well, it must have happened here and trying to, trying to fit the two together. You don't have to get, get what, what science, uh, so-called science, or any modern day uh, explanation of history, or how old this, that, or the other is. You don't have to take that and try to fit it into the Bible. Just believe the Bible. Just believe what the Bible says. Now, take you back to the last chapter of the book of John. This is a principle for you to live by, uh, for all of us to live by, the last chapter of the book of John. Tell me when you're there. All right. 
Look at the last verse. Look at the last verse. Now, let, let me pick on a couple of young people. I have to pick on the ones that I see are taking notes and opening their Bible because I see not all of our young people are doing that. And if you're in this service, this is your church, and you ought to have your Bible open, and you ought to be taking notes as well. So, Philip, come up here. Titus, you come up here too. I see you both got your Bibles open. You got your, got your, got your notes. Read. I want you to read for me. Get him a microphone. All right, verse 25. The last verse of the Gospel of John. Why don't, you, why don't you take that and just read that verse for me? And there was also many other things which Jesus did. Wait, 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 wait. A few other things that Jesus did? Many. What did it say? Many. Many other things. Okay, go ahead. Also, there are many other things which Jesus did. The which, if they should, if they should be written, every, be written everyone, I suppose that even the word itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. So there are so many things that even Jesus did that aren't recorded that he just gives the testimony the world itself couldn't even contain all the books just for the things that Jesus did. So we don't have record of everything. And we don't have to go around trying to make up stories and think, well, what kind of other things do you think he did? I think he stooped down by a mud puddle. <laughs> And he took some mud and he formed a little bird and he threw it up in the air and it flew away. That's one of the things that Jesus did. That's like a fairy tale or a bedtime story. And there's full grown adults that, 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 that believe that even though it's nowhere in the Bible. Trying to imagine. Oh, I can just imagine that Jesus, one day, he probably got out there and it was just dead calm. And, and you know, the one time it was a storm and he said, peace be still. So just for a little excitement, probably one time he got out there and he just said, come on, will you start blowing a little bit, you know, and start a little storm, get these guys a little nervous and, and you know, let's have some fun here. You know, you, you don't have to try to imagine anything. Let me show you why. Give me the microphone. Thank you, Philip. Appreciate your help. All right, we're going to go back to the previous chapter. And, and you get to read two verses. Can you handle that? Yeah. You sure? What verses are you going to read? 30 and 31. Okay, nice and loud. And many other wait, signs. Wait, 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 wait. And how many? A few? Many. Many. All right. And many other signs truly, not maybe, right? This is for certain. This is absolutely for certain. Okay, many other signs, truly. Did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. What? I thought we had everything written in this book. Oh, we don't have everything written in this book. We don't have everything written. And we don't have to, have to try to conjure up fairy tales and stories and good sounding theories and suppositions. Uh, and that is one of the definitions of theory, by the way, a supposition based on ignorance of the subject under discussion. <laughs> that, that is one of the definitions of theory. A theory is a supposition based on ignorance of the subject under discussion. So, so go ahead, if you want to theorize. All right, so let's, let's look at it again. They took it down already. Uh, uh, there we go, we got it back up. All right, come on, let's read it one more time. Let's read it together, everybody together. Help tide us out, go ahead. And, and many other signs truly, truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, disciples which, which are, are not written in this book. Now, this will help you immeasurably. This will help you immensely if you just open up right now and just embrace this next verse and the truth of this next verse. Go ahead and read that last verse. But these are written. But that these are written. But these are written. There, there are a lot that aren't written. But these are written. Go ahead. That you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Give both them young men a hand. Both did a great job. Thank you very much. What's the Bible teach you right there? That you don't have everything, every tidbit of history, that you don't have every answer, that you don't have everything even that Jesus did, but what you have is enough. What you have in that book is enough. 
Well, how come there's not more in there about miracles? How come there isn't more in there about family life? How come there isn't more in there about church structure and church life? How come there just isn't more in there about evangelism? How come there isn't more in there about prayer? I don't know, but I do know this, that what's in there is enough. I go back to, if it's enough to complete me and perfect me and thoroughly furnish me and fully equip me, I don't need anything else. The Bible is enough. It's not not enough and it's not too much. It's enough. It's enough. See, I don't have everything, but the things I do have are enough. Are enough to get me walking with the Lord and in right relationship with Him and, and that I might have life through His name. So... <clears throat> you know, was was there a time when it got warmer on the planet? Uh, yes. Was there a time when it got colder on the planet? Yes. Do you believe in climate change? Listen very carefully to me. Do you believe in, in climate change? Listen. Please listen. Do you believe, Pastor Clements, in climate change? Listen. I live in Wisconsin. <laughs> It changes about nine times a year here. We think it's spring, it goes back to winter. Then it turns to summer, and then it goes back and we have spring. And then we start summer, and it goes to fall, and then it goes back to spring. And then we finally settle into summer, and then it goes back to spring. Then it turns to summer. And by then it's fall. Tomorrow it'll be winter, and then it'll go back and we'll have Indian summer, whatever that is. We have a thaw every January. It gets to 50 degrees and the the birds start coming back. And we, yeah, I believe in climate change. I, 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 there's nothing in the Bible about it. You want to talk to me about it off on the side? I'm not going to talk over the holy desk on something that I just have an opinion about or a belief about. So it's changing a couple of degrees. Okay. All right. I get that. Uh, you think it's ever going to, you believe in global warming? You just wait and see one day how warm it gets on this planet. The Bible says the elements will melt with fervent heat when this whole planet is incinerated and every evidence of this entire age is totally burned away. All of the water even even gone. And the Bible says it'll, it'll be then reestablished as a new earth with a new atmosphere. That's what it means when it says new heavens. The new Jerusalem is not going to burn up. Okay, The heavens are, is the atmosphere around the planet, and the atmosphere will be replaced, and, and the earth will be reestablished. And the Bible says in Isaiah, and there will be no more sea. I, I, that's about all I know. But I know it will be one glorious, beautiful place. Amen. Amen. Yeah, it's going to get warm. Uh huh. <clears throat> All right. Hallelujah. That was a good question. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. What does the Bible say about it? Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. But I'm sure glad that everything the Bible does say is enough. It's enough to give me the armor that I need to live a victorious Christian life uh, and and thwart every attack of the enemy on me. Uh, It's enough to give uh, give me victory uh, uh, seven days a week, 366 days a year. Uh, It's enough to cause me to prosper and be in health even as my soul prospers. It's enough to renew my mind so that I can demonstrate the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. It's enough to give me something to meditate on day and night. makes me like the tree planted by the river, bearing fruit in my season. My leaf will never wither, and everything my hand touches surely prospers. It is enough to cause me to be blessed going in, coming out in the city, in the field, the head only and not the tail, above only and not beneath, enemies scattering before me and blessing, goodness, and mercy following me all the days of my life. It's enough for that. It's enough to bring me into right relationship with God. Righteousness is my nature. Jesus is my Lord, the Holy Spirit filling me. I'm his temple. It's enough to put the angels at charge all around me, keeping me in all of my ways. It's, it's enough to make me an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ and the kingdom of his God. It's enough to give me, give me what I need to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all things added to me. The Bible is enough. <clears throat> the Bible is enough. <clears throat> 
The Bible is enough. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, we've got a couple of minutes left. We'll go back to what we didn't get to last week. And this is another good question. And this is in regard, this is in regard to uh, the, the Holy Spirit. Thank God for the Holy Spirit that Jesus didn't just come, die on a cross, go back to heaven, and leave us alone. We have something that not one Old Testament saint, not Elijah, not Elisha, not Moses, not Noah, uh, not Joseph, not Abraham, not, <clears throat> not, not Joshua, uh, not Ezekiel, not Jeremiah, not Malachi, not Habakkuk, not, none of them had. <clears throat> we have the great awesome third person of the Godhead living inside of us. You're the temple of God, temple of the Holy Spirit, never leaves you, never forsakes you. You don't have to pray, take, pray not, take not your Holy Spirit from me. That's Old Testament doctrine, Old Testament. He already said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. He already said, I'll be with you always, even to the end of the age, even to the end of the age. So, so, so the, the question in particular is about my pastor, about my pastor, Dr. Barclay, obviously uh, uh, observed uh, or, or maybe personally experienced, doesn't say. It says, Dr. Barclay puts his hand on people and says, Holy Spirit, breathe on them. How is this different from the Pentecost baptism in the book of Acts? How's that different? That's a pretty good question. Can I have my whiteboard up here? Maybe that'll that that will will, will help will help with that. Uh, and, and let's turn back then to the to the book of Acts. The book of Acts actually is a continuation of the book of Luke. How many of you knew that? All right, help somebody that didn't. Yeah, tell them. Yep, the book of Luke is one of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Luke also wrote the book of Acts. So when you read the book of Luke, it's a very complete account of the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ starting before his birth. That's where we get all of our Christmas verses, and, and we love them, don't we? How the angel came to Nazareth, to the city of David, uh, and, and spoke to a virgin whose name was Mary and said, Hail, you who are highly favored. And she was troubled at the saying. Uh, and, and all the way through his ministry, all the way through his death, his burial, and his resurrection. All the way through after the resurrection, he came back and spoke to his followers, his closest followers. And the very last thing he said, it's on page 983 in my Bible. All right, it's Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter, last chapter of the book of Luke. And the last thing he says, the last thing he says to them is, starting in verse 46, because 47, 48, and 49 each start with the word and. So it's a continuation of the thought. Verse 46 it is written that it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Now remember this. This is what Luke is recording here. That this should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. You tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. And he, and he led them out as far as Bethany, lifted up his hands and blessed them. And he was parted from them, carried up into heaven. And they worshiped and returned to Jerusalem and were continually in the temple, praising and blessing God. Flip over to the book of Acts, over to the right, through John, right over to Acts. This is the continuation. This is Luke's second entry into the Bible. This is the second time the Holy Spirit is using him as an author to write and ordaining him. And he says, verse 1, the former treaty that I made, O Theophilus, that was the book of Luke, of all that Jesus began to do and teach till the day he was taken up. After he threw the Holy Spirit, gave commandments to the apostles whom he chose, to whom he showed himself alive after his passion, by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, speaking concerning and pertaining to the kingdom of God, and being assembled together with them, he commanded that they should not depart from Jerusalem. Isn't that what he just read? 
Don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you've heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now pause right there. Did it say Dr. Barclay puts his hand on people to baptize them with the Holy Spirit? He said, no, you can't do that. That's done in the Bible. That's done in the Bible. No, he just says, Holy Spirit, breathe on them. All right, let's, let's keep reading here. Uh, you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit, not many days from now. And, and, and they said, therefore, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said, it's not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own power, but you shall receive power. That's the same thing he said over in Luke 24. But you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit is come upon you. That's the exact same thing that, that he previously recorded. And you shall be witnesses unto me. That's exactly what he recorded before. In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth, that's what was previously recorded. And when he spoke those things, he was taken up and a cloud received them out of his sight. That's everything that he said in Luke chapter 24. And so that takes us up to and through 43 days after his crucifixion. Three days and nights suffering in the, in, in the place of eternal torment to pay for our sins. He was resurrected out of that place on the third day. And then he came back and showed himself to the apostles that night, his disciples. And he said, handle me. He had taken his blood to heaven, Hebrews chapter 9 and 10 says, and made an eternal redemptive sacrifice for us with it. Then he came back and said, handle me, touch me. He just finished telling us that Jesus was with them for 40 days after his passion. And so this is somewhere between, between 7 and 10 days, uh, most likely 7 days from the time he now is ascended into heaven, and they get to wait. They get to wait. Oh, what we all love to do. They get to wait. And they just get to wait. And they get to wait. And they get to wait. And when the day of Pentecost comes, penta means 50. Pentecost is 50 days after the Passover. Now, this didn't take God by surprise. It wasn't by accident. This was instituted all the way back in, in, in the book of Exodus and Leviticus and repeated for him in Deuteronomy, Numbers, that this is going to happen. This is God's will. This has been God's plan for thousands of years. This has been God's plan from the very beginning that, that, that he would take up residence by his spirit, that his Holy Spirit would come, that one day his Holy Spirit, that from time to time just reached down out of heaven, like with Elijah, and the Bible says, and the hand of the Lord came upon Elijah, and he outran the king's chariot. Or the hand of the Lord came upon the prophet in Second uh, uh, Chronicles chapter 20, and he stood and he, and he prophesied. But every time the hand of the Lord came upon a person, then the hand of the Lord lifted off of him. The Holy Spirit never, ever, ever came and, and just abide, to abide. Remember what John the Baptist said? The one who sent me to baptize in water said this, the one you see the Holy Spirit descending upon and lighting and landing and staying there, that's the Messiah. That's the one you're waiting for. That's the one you've all been looking for. That's the one. That's the sign. That's how you'll know. And he said, when I, when I brought him up out of the water, I watched the Holy Spirit just like a dove landing on a limb. The Holy Spirit slowly settling right down on him to abide, stayed there. He said, that's the sign. Now I know. Now I know. You do not get filled with the Holy Spirit, and then he lifts and goes away. But I feel so lonely. Doesn't matter how you feel. Only thing that matters is what the Bible says. And the Bible says he's with you. The Bible says he come to make his abode in you. The Bible says you're his temple, and that's where he lives now. The Bible says he'll never leave you and never forsake you. If you feel like he left, uh, your feelings are misguiding you. Trust in the Bible, not in your feelings. Your feelings are an unsafe guide always. The Bible is an eternal guide and always perfect. So, 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 he, uh, 
He, the Holy Spirit, is going to be sent from heaven and is going to abide on each of these people just like, just like upon Jesus. See, Jesus didn't do all of those works that he did because he had come from heaven. Philippians chapter 2 says he left all of his glory and power and dignity and ability. He left all that in heaven and was born as a baby, an infant. That's why he had to be baptized or filled with the Holy Spirit had to come upon him. Acts 10, 38 says this, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. Whenever you see in your Bible, Jesus of Nazareth, that's the, that's the natural designation of who he was. The natural, not the supernatural, the temporal, not the eternal. Jesus of Nazareth. The Holy Spirit had to anoint Jesus of Nazareth. Yeah. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Amen. People that want to argue and fuss, I don't argue and fuss about anything. If you want it, it's available. If you don't, live without it. But the baptism with the Holy Spirit, I, I, just, I just ask, I, I've, asked, I've asked probably dozens, scores, maybe hundreds of people this one question. If Jesus needed it, why don't you? If Jesus couldn't do what he did without the, with, he continually gave, gave credit to to, to, to God the Father and God the Father's power. And he said, the works that I do, uh, uh, they're not because of me. You know, they're, they're not my works. They're not my works. I just must be too much for the equipment tonight. <laughs> Could be. So, so uh, uh, forgive us, those of you who are streaming, I'm not sure if that glitching is, is coming across on the, on the live feed or not, but we're having a lot of technical difficulties here. Uh, it may be lightning. I know there's a lot in the area tonight, and I know it's blowing right through and going over us and going around us. Uh, and those of you who are here, don't get shook up by the, you know, a little bit. Don't, don't look at the screen. Don't look at the man behind the screen. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's move on here. <laughs> All right. I see you all recognize that. <laughs> So, so what does Dr. Barclay mean when he says Holy Spirit breathed on them? Is that the same as the Pentecost baptism in Acts? Absolutely no. No, it's not. Uh, in Acts, uh, after chapter 1, uh, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, that just simply means the sun was up over the horizon, it was daylight. It was daytime in Pentecost. It was 50 days after Passover. And when the day of Pentecost, chapter 2, verse 1, was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. It's hard to get human beings. I mean, you can get them in one, one place, but some of them have orange jerseys and some of them have purple jerseys. Or some of them have gold jerseys and some of them have green jerseys. Or some of them have white jerseys and some of them have black jerseys. Whenever you get people together, there's factions and sects and, and, and groups and cliques and things. Man, they had 120 people and, and they were all in one accord. Praise God. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind and filled the house where they were sitting and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like fire and sat upon each one of them and sat upon each one of them. And, 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 and they were all, how many? All. Somebody else help me. How many? All. all filled with the Holy Spirit and began. Now see, this wasn't the only time. This is just the beginning. They began to speak with other tongues as that's called in, in the Greek word, that, that's the word glossolalia, glossolalia. Uh, I wouldn't waste my time looking it up because the definitions that you find in Wikipedia and, and some of those are hilarious. They're, they're a waste of time. They don't know what they're talking about. The book of Proverbs says it's, 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 uh, it's foolish for a person to try and answer a matter when he doesn't know anything about it. That, that's, that, that's my paraphrase, but you know what it says is only a fool answers a matter before he's heard the entirety of it. It's foolish to try and answer a matter you don't know anything about. So, so you know, we all ought to learn from that. There are a lot of things I don't know anything about. And, and, and people inquire about it, and I, I don't know. You don't have to know everything. Get over yourself thinking you have to know everything. I don't know. I don't know. Were there ever woolly mammoths and saber-toothed tigers? I don't know. And furthermore, I don't care. <laughs> why would I care? Yeah, why would I, did all the birds make it to the ark? Don't. 
I, I, I know the ones that we have now did. <laughs> right? Yes. Right? Huh? Yes. Yeah, pheasants and quail and, 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 and cardinals. And I know they made it. Amen. Well, what do you think? I don't think. I don't think about whether or not there was one little bird out there. But, oh, my Okay. Better a birdie land on top of the thing. Open that window. Please. His eye is on the sparrow. <laughs> Open the window. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. Praise the Lord. Some of you ought to get in it. It's a fun flow tonight. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, this, this, you know, it's not deep, but, but it is important then for you know, your theology, your, your, your doctrine, to, to be correct. This is the initial. This is the initial infilling with the Spirit. This, this is when he comes and takes up residence and abides. The initial infilling in these people's lives. Initial. The initial. Now, what was, what was, what was, the, what was the, 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 the one characteristic that he said that they would note, that they would notice, that they would receive? What was the one thing he said you'll receive when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Power. What is it? Power. power. Chapter 1, verse 8. But you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit is come upon you. You shall be empowered. And so the initial infilling with God's Holy Spirit is an empowerment. Not to lift more weights, to run, you know, faster. Empowerment for lifting, running, calisthenics, thinking, work, recreation. No, for service. Empowerment for service is what the baptism with the Holy Spirit is all about. The initial infilling brings power for service. That's what, it, that's what it is, all right? Different from it's maintained by glossolalia. What's glossolalia? Uh, and they all began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. 1 Corinthians 14, verses 2 through 5. 1 Corinthians 14, 2 through 5. Now, I hope the screen doesn't go crazy here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just read off it. Okay, I won't. All right, 1 Corinthians 14, and, and I'll read 2 through, two through 5. All right, it says... He that speaks in an unknown tongue does not speak to men, but unto God. No man understands him. In the spirit he speaks mystery. He that prophesies speaks to men to edify, exhort, and comfort. He that speaks in an unknown tongue, what are those next two words there? What's the word edify? It's empower. It is empower. You don't talk with tongues till you get filled with the Holy Spirit. After you get filled with the Holy Spirit, you ought to pray in tongues every day. Amen. That's the initial infusion of power to serve. The baptism with the Holy Spirit. It's maintained by praying in other tongues. He that speaks in an unknown tongue edifies himself. He that prophesies edifies the church. What's verse 5 start out to say? I would that you all speak with tongues. He says down in verse 18, I thank God I speak with tongues more than you all. You read some of these commentaries that Paul didn't think much of talking in tongues. It's only for just a few. All throughout that chapter, it says it's for everybody. It says it's for all. Okay? Uh, verses 
Yeah, I speak with tongues more than you all. Uh, and then again, back to verse 4, edifies himself. Jude, verse 20. Jude is a small little, just a one chapter uh, uh, book right before Revelation. So if you turn backwards, it'll be second to the last book. Jude, verse 20. But you, beloved, building up yourselves, not the Lord building you up, you build yourself up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Praying in the Holy Ghost. You go back to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 14, and that'll tell you that that's praying in other tongues. And so the initial infilling empowers you for service, and then the rest of your life, that empowerment is maintained in your prayer life by praying in the Spirit. Yeah, maintained, and, and, and you don't have to go back and, oh, I, I'm so weak. Uh, I, I'm so, that, that's an admission that you're not praying. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm just I, just, I just really need the Lord to baptize me again because I used to have power and now I don't. I don't know what happened to it. Well, it gets used up. But you have a generator down on the inside of you and rivers of living water flow across that generator. And, and that's, that's what Jesus, when he was talking with the folks, and, and, and he said, uh, the, 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 the life that's in you is a well. That, that, that's a well and brings everlasting life. That's salvation. And that's the Holy Spirit's work too. Titus 3, 5, 5, 6, and 7 say that's the Holy Spirit's work. Titus 3, 5 says, not by works of righteousness, which you have done, but by his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. When you accept what Jesus did for you and confess him as your savior, the Holy Spirit comes in and, goes, and totally cleanses you on the inside, makes you a brand new creature in the twinkling of an eye, regenerates you and, and, and washes you and cleanses you. And now you're a child of God. But you're still not filled with his spirit. We, we see that right here. He said to them, wait until you are. We see it again in Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 10. Uh, matter of fact, you can just look at Acts chapter 8 with me really quick. Because we're in church and this is the Bible. Yeah. Glory to God. Acts chapter 8. Uh, and, and, and let's just look at a couple of, a couple of verses. Just, just look at verse 14. Now when the apostles that were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria. See, Philip had gone down to Samaria in verse 5. And he preached what? He preached Christ to them. And, and look at verse 12. When they believed. Wait a minute. Now they're believers, aren't they? When they believed Philip's preaching concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized. And so now they're baptized believers. Now look at verse 14. When the apostles at Jerusalem heard that they'd received the word of God, they sent Peter and John. When they came down, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen, there is that word again, upon. He, was, he, they did, he did a work in them when they were born again, when they were saved, when they believed. But he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. That was the initial empowerment. See, the new birth does not empower you for anything. Being born again causes your sins to be forgiven and causes you to become a member of the family of God. doesn't empower you for service. I was born again when I was nine years old on the left side of the altar at Cedarville Evangelical Congregational Church in Cedarville, Illinois, a few miles outside of Freeport, Illinois, a few miles west of Rockford, Illinois, which is a few miles west of Chicago, Illinois. And as nine years old, I went down there, knelt down, received Jesus, and for the next 14 years was saved, was righteous, was a child of God, and was weak as water. Had no power whatsoever until August the 10th of 1983. 14 years later, received the baptism in the Holy Spirit and haven't been weak since. Woo! Haven't had a weak week since. Haven't had a weak day since. Haven't had a weak hour since. Had some challenges, but have learned how to overcome them through the power of the one who lives inside of me. Greater is he who's in me than he who's in the world. What's the secret, Pastor, of always staying empowered and strong? No, no secret. It's right there. It's wide open. Open your. There it is. Pray in the Spirit every day. Every day. Yeah. Every day. Every day. All right. I'm 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 running short of time. I think, but my clock is off. So leave it off. Just leave it off. <laughs> Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19. You've got these believers here, and Paul asks this question. 
there were, he found certain disciples in verse 1. Verse 2, and he said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said, we haven't even so much as heard whether there be a Holy Ghost. That was me. I knew I had to pray the sinner's prayer. I knew I had to receive Jesus. I knew my sins were washed away. I knew I was going to heaven when I died. I didn't know there was any Holy Ghost. What is that about? I started reading my Bible. That's dangerous to the devil. That's dangerous to ignorance. That's dangerous to weakness. That's, that's, that, that's dangerous to the status quo of your life. You know what status quo means, right? The miserable state that we're in. That's what status quo means. No, reading your Bible will change everything for you. And, and ask God to help you as you do. And, and I would read verses like this. And, and verse 2, have you received the Holy Ghost? They said, we haven't even heard that there is such a thing and as a Holy Ghost. He said, well, you're baptized too. They said, John's baptism. He explained to them and said, John's baptism was for repentance, that they should believe on him that came after. That was Christ Jesus. When they heard that, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Here we go again. These are baptized believers. And when Paul, and here it is again, laid his hands on them. You don't get... People arguing, write me letters and notes and show their ignorance and say, well, that was when they just got saved. You don't get saved by having hands laid on you. You get saved by believing in your heart and confessing with your mouth, not have hands laid on you. You receive the baptism with the Holy Spirit when hands are laid on you, just like we, we just read in chapter 8. And we, and we see it again right here in verse 6 of chapter 19. Paul laid his hands on them and the Holy Ghost came on them. There it is again, not in them, on them. And they spoke with tongues and prophesied. That's the initial evidence. Do you speak in tongues? Well, I did back in 1956 when I got the baptism. You're probably weak as water. Doesn't matter if the generator's in there, if it's sitting still. Yeah, he said, he said salvation, that'll be like a well of living water on the inside of you. Wells bring life. But, but he said, when he comes, which, which he can't come yet because I'm not yet glorified, when the Holy Spirit comes, that'll be rivers of living water coming out of your innermost being. Rivers of living water. Not just like the Mississippi, like the Mississippi and the Missouri and the Amazon and the Ohio all together. Rivers of living water. And, and a moving river produces power. Every, every dam up and down the Mississippi River has the capacity to produce hydroelectric power. This little bitty dam over here at, at Lake Neshonic in, 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 in West Salem, Wisconsin, was originally built to power the whole town. Power the whole town. Just the water going through, nothing more. And he said that river of living water is on the inside of you after you receive the baptism. But if you don't open your mouth and let it roll and let it flow and let it run, and, and, and then, then, then there's no power. There's no power whatsoever. Kick the generator into gear and, and empower your life every day. Every day? You mean every day? I mean every, I mean every day. I mean every day. And so, so you've got the Holy Spirit, and he comes, and, and, and that's the initial. If, if we look at, at chapter 2, uh, that's, the, that's the initial infilling. That's the initial infilling. Look with me at chapter 4 in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 4. And this is after Peter and John are arrested and they're threatened and they go back to their own company in verse 23 and report the, the, the threats. And they begin to lift up their voice and talk to the Lord and pray. Everybody say pray. pray. Look at verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and spoke the word of God with boldness. Well, wait a minute. I thought they were filled back in chapter 2. They were, but they, they apparently ran, ran out. And it doesn't say anything about the initial evidence. It doesn't say, it just said the Holy Spirit came on them. And, 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 and then what happened? And then what happened? They spoke the word of God with boldness. They spoke the word. Uh, go back to chapter 3. Go back to chapter 3. Look at verse, look at verse 19. And, and, and this is after they'd been, had that initial infilling. And, and verse 19 says, repent, therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. That's really all Dr. Barclay is doing. He, he's, just saying, he's just saying, breathe on these people. Refresh these people. Just, just blow on this person right now. Just move on this person right now. Just come up on them right now. Just, 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 just refresh them right now. Lift their cares and burdens and, 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 and move on their life. Uh, 
Let me, uh, let me go ahead here to uh, Acts. Go to Acts chapter, chapter 13. Chapter 13. Now, this is where they had the church meeting, and there were prophets and teachers there, and they ministered to the Lord and fasted. And remember this, because I'm going to refer to it in just a moment. And the Holy Ghost said, who said? And what did he do? He said, Barnab separate Barnabas and Saul for the work I've called them to. And when they fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. And they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia and came and siled to Cy Cyprus. And, and, and then it tells all about this, this gentleman who was uh, resisting their preaching. Look at verse 9. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, Filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, and he spoke to him by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. You remember back in the Old Testament where it said the Holy Spirit would come upon a person for a certain, they would prophesy or they would sing, or in Elijah's case, he outran the king's chariot. In Samson's case, he'd tear lions apart when the hand of God would come upon him. Well, here the hand of God comes upon upon. Uh, Saul, who, whose name is also Paul now, uh, and, and he speaks on behalf of God. Now, we, we, just, we just read back that when they prayed, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spoke the Word of God with boldness. Peter talked about times of refreshing would come. The, uh, the simplest answer, the simplest answer here is, uh, no, this is not the Pentecost baptism. When, 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 when Dr. Barclay would pray and say, Holy Spirit, touch this person right now. Holy Spirit, breathe on this person right now. Holy Spirit, refresh this person right now. Holy Spirit, uh, uh, move in, in, in this person's life right now. Uh, bring peace to this person in their troubled state right now, in this anxiousness and anxiety that they're in, and just help them. Stop and think about, stop and think about all that the Holy Spirit does after you're filled with the Spirit. See, back in John chapter 14, he's called the Comforter. So after you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, is that the end of your relationship with the Holy Spirit? <laughs> That's just the beginning. That's just the very beginning. See, Acts chapter 2 and verse 4, help me, what's it say? And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to, as, as the Spirit gave them utterance. He keeps working with you the whole rest of your life, giving you utterance and giving you utterance and giving you utterance and giving you utterance. Giving you utterance. He's the one that creates it down on the inner side, on the innermost part of your being. From your belly shall flow rivers of living. He's the one that generates it. Speaking in other tongues starts in heaven. It starts with God. It comes via the Holy Spirit and just comes flowing out of you and it helps you. And then according to Romans 8, it also prays the perfect will of God for the saints. So he's continually working in your life after that initial infilling. He's working to comfort you. He's called the comforter. He's working to help you. He's called the helper. Who is it that manifests the healing in Christians' bodies? Is it Jesus? No, he's still in heaven. He's seated at the Father's right hand. His work is done for the, for the, for the time being. Till the last trumpet blows, his work is done. Is it God the Father? No, he's in heaven, seated on the throne, has never left it, never vacated it, and did not get run off it Amen. in the great mutiny and rebellion. He's never moved. No, it's the Holy Spirit that came on the day of Pentecost, and those only those 120 people were the first recipients. First recipients. And I don't know how, it's been, how many it's been between them and us, but we're some of them. We're some of those. Pentecostals got baptized. We're baptized Methodists and baptized Lutherans and baptized Catholics and baptized atheists and we're baptized everything. Christians, no matter what you used to be, Christians, full of the Holy Ghost, full of the Holy Ghost. And he's still working and he's still moving. Think about this verse. Think about this verse. Paul besought the Lord three times and the Lord said, my grace is sufficient for you. Every act of grace on the earth today is due to the Holy Spirit's ministry. Every act of grace that God does. Every person getting saved, Titus 3, 5 through 7. Every person getting filled, 
baptism of the Holy Spirit, every utterance, every bringing to remembrance, John chapter 16, he'll bring to remembrance the things you've heard of me. Every time you remember a verse and remember a scripture, that's the Holy Spirit. How about this one? How about this one? Uh, uh, Mark 16, verse 20. And they went and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, confirming the word with signs following. Who's that? That's the Holy Spirit. He, he is the Lord working in the earth today to bring people, to draw people, to, to convict people, to bring them to Christ, to, to, to hear your cry, uh, to live inside of you, to encourage you, to equip you. He's the one working to comfort you and to bring you the peace of God that surpasses all understanding, to keep your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. He brings to remembrance the things that Jesus is talking. He's the one that opens the word. He is the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. He says, he says grace us with the spirit of wisdom. In, in, in Ephesians chapter 3, he starts out and he says, for this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, whom the whole family of heaven and earth his name, that he would grant unto you to be strengthened with might by his spirit in your inner man. That, that's the Holy Spirit. That's the same spirit that came upon Samson, glory to God, the spirit of might. The Holy Spirit's working all the time to renew your mind, to confirm God's word in your life, to refresh you, times of refreshing. Praise God. Isn't it great when you're just worshiping the Lord and you just come out of it like, you know, I don't have a care in the world and I was tired when I got here, but I'm so on fire right now and I'm enthused right now. Thank God for the, for the great, great work of the Holy Ghost. Praise God. Amen. Thanks for the question. Uh, thanks for the Lord uh, for the answer. Uh, thanks for helping us. Thank you for continually working with us and working in us and never quitting and never giving up on us and never leaving us and never forsaking us and being with us always, even to the end of the age. I, I'm not sure how doctrinally correct it is. Uh, I'm not going to argue with it. Neither am I going to support it. But, but, I, but I heard one old time preacher said, I think I've figured out uh, how the rapture is going to work, how the catching away and the gathering into heaven. The Lord's just going to call the Holy Spirit back. And he's going back to heaven and everybody he's in is going with him. That's what he said. I, I, you know, it works for me. Because I do know during the time of what we call the tribulation period, uh, the, the Bible says there won't be anybody saved here. How could there be if the Holy Spirit's gone? And 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 says, He who is now restraining evil will be taken out of the way, and then evil's going to just go crazy and run rampant. That, that'd be the Holy Spirit. That'd be the Spirit of God. Praise God, He's in me. Aren't you, aren't you happy He's in you? I said, aren't you happy? Greater is He who's in you than he that's in the world. Your Bible, 1 John 4, 4, let's all stand. It says, it says, you have overcome them. Not you are overcoming them, or maybe someday you'll overcome. It says, you have overcome them. Say, I have, I have, I have, I have, I have overcome them. Overcome. For greater is he who's in me than he who's in the world. Amen, in Jesus' name. Our altar minister. Thank you for watching The Word of the Lord a weekly television broadcast of Living Word Christian Church. Living Word Christian Church welcomes you to join us at 2015 Ward Avenue in La Crosse, Wisconsin, Sunday mornings at 8.15 and 10.30, and Wednesday evenings at 7. For more information on Living Word Christian Church, visit us on the web at lwcclax.com.